Welcome back to Coffee Break. You'll notice I am not dressed in black and I am not shooting this in black and white because this is a different kind of intro. Every week I post these, or almost every week, I post these videos and most of the people I send it to watch them. Uh, YouTube tells me not everybody watches it all. I get that. That's okay. Um, but today, I think you will want to stick around to the very end of this video because this is a video unlike any video I have ever created for this channel. Hang around. As a teacher, you're always looking for ways to help your students succeed. And one of the most important measures of student success is their proficiency on statewide standardized assessments, whether we like it or not. But how do you ensure that your grading practices in the classroom are aligned with these assessments? So in this video, we will discuss some strategies you can use to help make sure your grading practices reflect your students' proficiency levels on these important tests. First and foremost, it's important to understand what proficiency on statewide standardized assessments means. These assessments are designed to measure student learning and achievement in a particular subject based on a set of predetermined standards. So proficiency then refers to a student's ability to meet or exceed these standards. When you're grading your students' work in the classroom, it's important to keep these standards in mind and to make sure that your grading practices reflect them. So how can you do this? Well, here are a few strategies to consider. First of all, use standards-based grading. One of the best ways to ensure that your grading practices align with statewide standards is to use a standards-based grading system. This means that your grading system is based on a set of predetermined standards or learning objectives and that you grade your students' work based on their ability to meet these objectives. By using a standards-based grading system, you'll be able to easily see which students are meeting or exceeding statewide standards and which students need additional support to reach these benchmarks. The second thing you can do is to utilize rubrics. Rubrics are another great tool to use when you're grading your students' work. A rubric is just simply a scoring tool that breaks down the criteria for a particular assignment or task into different levels of achievement. So by using a rubric, you'll be able to clearly communicate your expectations for the assignment and your students will be able to see exactly what they need to do to achieve a particular grade. Rubrics can also help you to be more consistent in your grading, since you'll be using the same criteria to evaluate all of your students' work. The next thing you can do is focus on mastery. When you're grading your students' work, it's important to focus on the mastery of the subject rather than just completion. This means that you are looking for evidence that your students have truly mastered a particular skill or a concept rather than simply checking off that they've completed an assignment. So by focusing on mastery, you'll be able to more accurately assess your students' proficiency levels and you'll be able to provide more targeted feedback to help your students improve. The next thing you can do is provide opportunities for revision. It's important to provide your students with these opportunities based on your feedback. This not only helps to reinforce the idea that learning is a process, but it also gives your students a chance to demonstrate that they've truly mastered a particular skill or a concept. By allowing your students to revise their work, you'll also be able to more accurately assess their proficiency levels since you'll be seeing evidence of their ability to improve over time. And by using these strategies, you'll be able to make sure that your grading practices in the classroom reflect your students' proficiency levels on statewide standardized assessments. 
Of course, every classroom and every teacher is different. So it's important to find the strategies that work best for you and for your students. But by keeping these statewide standards in mind and by focusing on mastery and growth, you can help your students succeed not just in the classroom, but also on these assessments. We'll see you next time. All right, so you may be wondering, Tim, what was so different about that? I mean, you talked for a little while, blathered on about grading and stuff. And well, let me tell you, for the first time, I used a script that was generated for me by Chat GPT. A script that was generated on the fly through artificial intelligence. I asked it to write a specific post for me comparing teachers' grading practices to standardized tests and what could be done to better align those two things. Wasn't really sure what I was going to get. I also told it to limit it to a certain number of words so it didn't get very long. Had no idea what I was going to get, but when it was done, I thought, you know what, if I was going to write a brief paper about this topic, this is what I would write. And instead of laboring over it for hours, it took less than 90 seconds. So I've been playing around with Jet Chat GPT, um, and I, I asked uh, Hannah Jacobson to send me a writing prompt from Springboard. And I had to do a little finagling around it because it involved an image that I couldn't get into Chat GPT. Um, but I did get I did get it to recognize the article that I wanted to use just by typing in the name of the article. That's all it needed. Um, and I asked the question that was in the writing prompt, and it gave me a pretty decent answer. So I sent that to Hannah, and I said, what do you think about this? And she plugged it into a tool that we have access to from a springboard, and it immediately recognized it as being written through artificial intelligence, which is good because you can't do the typical thing of saying, oh, I found this clip, this paragraph here, I found it on the internet over here, I know you plagiarized it. It's not being plagiarized from anywhere. So I had ChatGPT rewrite the essay on a fifth grade writing level, and I had it choose five random words throughout that it would misspell. It gave me the list of words it was gonna misspell, so that's fine and ask it to write the answer again, this time shorter, because a fifth grader wouldn't write that much. And it gave me, it's, you know, it kind of spit out another version of the same essay, and I sent it to Hannah, and it still recognized it as artificial intelligence. And I think that's crucial. Now, artificial intelligence is here. It's not ready yet, but it's here. And we are going to have to start using it in some form or fashion in education. Maybe not before the end of this year, but soon. So the thing that we will need to think about doing is how do we get kids to understand its limitations or to use its power in a positive way? If they understand that if that if they go to an artificial intelligence source and have it write their paper for them, if they understand we can detect that as BS, or I'm sorry, as AI, <laughs> then maybe they won't, be, they won't be tempted to do that much. But there are some things they could do. So for instance, I went back into chat GPT and I asked it to write a citation for The Outsiders by S.E. Hinton and I ask it in three different ways. So I'm going to let this play while I'm talking, but I ask it for a citation in MLA format. I don't remember the order here. I ask for a citation in APA format, and I ask for a citation in uh, Chicago style format. And um, it was perfect. So 
rather than have to go back to the MLA handbook, which I did for years writing papers, I could just type in the source I'm using and say, give me that. And it will give me a perfect um, citation that I can plug into my research paper. So that's, that's one way it could be used. The other is if you've got students who just don't know how to start, if they just don't know how to start, the other thing that I did was ask it to write an outline uh, on, I think it was the character Pony Boy from The Outsiders. Uh, and you'll see in this video clip exactly what my prompt was. And it gave me a really decent outline where I could then take that and write a paper. I don't think that we would be too hard on students if all they did was use artificial intelligence to get them off of the blank page. And then the rest of it has to come from them. And so then I took it a step further and I said, okay, so I want to teach an introductory lesson on the outsiders. And so I went back in to chat GPT and I asked it to give me a lesson plan that included a warm-up activity and included a group activity. And within just a minute or a minute and a half, it had given me a pretty decent outline of a lesson plan that I could use to build off of myself. Now, ChatGPT and other uh, AI sources like it, are, they're not here yet. I mean, they're not ready yet. They're not ready to take over the world. We're not at Skynet yet, okay? <laughs> um, but there is some power there. There's a lot of downsides to it, um, a lot of bias built in. Um, and I have, a, I have a nephew who is uh, in, I mean, he's, he's a coder uh, and, and does a great job as a computer coder. And he has uh, warned me of some things that are there. I've got another friend who used to be an English teacher. Uh, he's no longer in education, but he warned me about um, some false positives, that it, it made up its own history as it was writing stories. It, it, it created citations from uh, articles that didn't exist. <laughs> so there's still some problems. But there are some positive things that we can look at with AI that might actually benefit you in the long term as a teacher. And it might bring some benefit to your kids to help them up their game when it comes to being able to write well. We'll see you next time.